Yo, yo, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Cosmic Origins. This is the Cosmic Download. My name is Jace. Glad to have you all here. I'm going to go ahead and light a little bit of Palo Santo as we do to get things started, set the vibe. We have a lot of fascinating stories today that correlate to a lot of the things we've been talking about on this channel lately and bringing forward more kind of tangible evidence for these things that we've been talking about as far as clarity around cryptocurrency, cyber attacks, this great reset, what's going on right now with the G20. It all kind of comes together. So we're really going to dive into that. Um, lots to talk about. But first, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the Family of Light Gathering that we are hosting in Sedona, Arizona, coming up in just two weeks now. We're getting so close and seats are really filling up. They're getting limited. So if you have not already got a, a physical pass, I recommend doing that ASAP so that you know you can reserve yourself a seat if you plan on coming. Otherwise, we do have the live stream passes available at a pretty reasonable price for three days. And that's going to include the eight plus hours a day of all the speakers. Um, we're going to show you behind the scenes, the vendors, the dance party, uh, lots of good stuff. So if you'd like to see these speakers, the Kate Awakening, Alexander Mazone, Rion, Sexual Kung Fu, Jonathan White, Journey to Truth Podcast, Alara, Alexis of Ascension Diaries, myself, Matthew Mornian, Rion, Xavier Hawk, Troy Casey, Certified Health Nut, Zen God, Yolanda with Yoga. Lots of great stuff. So it's going to be awesome if you haven't checked this out yet. Familyoflight.info and live stream passes you can get here. If you pay with crypto, there is an extreme discount if you pay with XRP. So hope to see you guys there. It's going to be really, really fun. And to jump into our first story, basically the big bombshell of this week was that Elizabeth Warren, who, you know, <laughs> will... We'll not get into our thoughts on her in particular, but she has been a voice of um, kind of trying to single out, create regulatory clarity around crypto, but also kind of anti-crypto the way that she's doing it. Um, you know, the way I see these things is that these, these guys are all pretty much puppets at this point, right? So, you know, obviously um, the whole thing with the, with the last election and what was going on with her and everything uh take that into context but i feel like that these people are just puppets at this point that are playing out the show what is supposed to happen so i don't really look at these individuals as being like good or bad anymore it's more of just what role are they playing and for what's to come with these big shifts so what role is warren playing here well she's calling for she wrote a letter to sec uh, uh chair gary gensler who, if you've been following the XRP lawsuit, you're very familiar with him and the role that he will likely have to play in this Ripple XRP lawsuit with the SEC. But she basically called for him to have full uh, regulation by the 28th of January this month in July. So that's pretty, pretty wild. And um, it's hard to say how this is exactly going to play out, but, you know, we could actually on the most optimal timeline, I think, or one of them, we could get Gary Gensler essentially telling the uh, the part of the SEC that's on this case that they need to have it settled or wrapped up by the 28th. That could be very likely. And then we could see a settlement with Ripple or a complete uh, uh, withdrawal of the case completely. I don't, you know, I'm not a legal expert. I'm not sure how those things can work out on the technical side of things but it's looking like we are going to get clarity very soon. So it's also possible this is kind of a smokescreen and this could be, you know, infinitely extended. It's possible we get to the 28th and, and Warren and whoever else are like, okay, we're going to give you an extra 90 days or whatever. Because obviously when it comes to dates, we've seen a lot of that kind of uh, manipulative market kind of uh, actions taken by these groups. And, you know, market manipulation goes both ways. I think that both the negative, the dark groups and the positive groups are manipulating the market and there's AIs involved and there's all other s sorts of tech and uh, plans involved right now with the way that the market and this great reset is playing out. But uh, yeah, basically, basically they are cracking down on unregulated cryptos. And one of the things that they in particular kind of called out which i found very interesting was DeFi, 
And so again, I think these people are playing a role. I think that we can't quite look at this as being good or bad. It's just kind of bringing more exposure and conversation around these topics in general. So, you know, you could, if you were going to look at this on the surface, you could say it's good that she's trying to get clarity, but maybe it's bad that they're going after DeFi because in particular, uh, let me see if I can find the quote. They talked about how uh, DeFi... how DeFi basically circumvents the normal regulatory uh, actions that need to be taken. And uh, this is where it says, and the concerns decentralized finance may raise for the SEC's jurisdiction. So this is where projects like Flare and of course Flare Finance, which is the DeFi platform being built on Flare, but Flare being the parent network. Um, this is where this is really gonna get interesting in the coming weeks and months and years with DeFi because as we know Ethereum has done uh, a lot in the DeFi space to kind of get that out there to the masses but Flare is really going to take it next level. Um, Ethereum is really just a mess. We've talked about that before. You know people who are pro Ethereum keep saying oh well the you know the proof of st stake and the the Ethereum 2.0 is going to be coming soon, but they've been saying that for years. And quite frankly, Ethereum is just a mess in general. The founders have a lot of questionable uh, ethics about them. Uh, one being that uh, Vitalik Buterin has publicly defended child pornography. Um, so there's that. But <laughs> aside from the the kind of that side of it, Flare Networks is going to really revolutionize the game with bringing. DeFi applications to not only the greater crypto space for non-DeFi projects like XRP, XLM, Doge, Litecoin, namely, but potentially Bitcoin and other uh, non-DeFi cryptos in the future. And it's also going to make passive income a really accessible thing to retail investors and really just revolutionize the decentralized economy. And so when looking at, you know, the way that uh, Warren and the Senate uh, are because you know she's kind of just acting on behalf of the Senate and whoever her handlers are. Um, we're we're seeing that they are they're seeing DeFi as a risk, and you know again, it's hard to say exactly good or bad what energies are behind this because I think ultimately it's all pointing towards transparency of what is to come and it, you know waking people up to these realities. So a lot of people reading this may have never even heard about DeFi, but because. It's being talked about by Elizabeth Warren, and now it's, you know, this is warren.senate.gov that we're on right now. So this is just this concept is introducing DeFi to people. So this this concept of having um, completely decentralized economies where you don't need middlemen, you don't need brokers, you don't need centralized exchanges. And that's why, you know, agencies like the SEC may be concerned because all of a sudden they go from regulating private entities that they can control to oh, now there's decentralized spaces in the finance world that they don't necessarily have the um, capability to necessarily regulate because it is decentralized. But this is where we'll really see, I think, restructuring in the SEC uh, moving forward. And that not only as the SEC, but the, you know, the economics of the American and international financial systems in general. But really starting with America, I think we're going to see the changes uh, most likely. So that is fascinating, and yeah, we could we could see that happening as early as this month, but I'm also not getting my hopes up because you never know what could happen. And again, with these dates, they tend to continuously get extended, and so I don't I don't get my hopes up for dates at all anymore. By the way, if you're watching this right now and you're wondering if this is live or not, this is uh, pre-recorded just an hour ago or so this morning. Um, just decided to switch things up today and pre-record this and see how it went. So um, let's keep moving on. We talked about Flare and Flare Finance. The other news with that is that Flare is now available on the Ledger Nano products. So if you have a Ledger Nano hardware wallet, whether it's an X or an S, and you are set to receive the Spark airdrop, or even if you know, you're not set to receive it, it's just good info to know that Ledger is now officially supporting uh, the Flare application wallet on their devices. So if you want to know how to set that up, um, I would recommend going to Flare community, Twitter, and YouTube channel. And he has a lot of great information about how to apply this if you need to uh, figure out you know, where your Flare is going to show up and how to access it and all that kind of stuff if you're using 
Ledger in particular. So I recommend Flare Community for that. A uh, great source of information. And I think this is also a an indication that we are going to be seeing Flare launch very soon, right? So we have, again, Warren calling for regulatory clarity from the SEC. We have Flare that has been set to launch for quite some time now, Flare Networks. They've told us um, end of quarter two, and then it became late June, early July. You know, now we're almost in mid-July. It's been feeling to me like they're waiting to flip the switch in a way, like they are waiting for a particular moment to, um, to flip that switch, really. And that could be the greater flip switch of the reset, but you know, it's also possible that they're going to launch this network before that happens. And that would be positive because it would, um, I mean, both timelines are positive, but at the silver lining of the, uh, of the possibility of the network going live before we get say the XRP moon or the, the, uh, the switch flipping is that it'll give us an opportunity to make passive income on our XRP and our other cryptos while we wait for this utility run to come in. So kind of to break this down again, for those that maybe haven't heard this before, when it comes to XRP and these other institutional financial, you could call them QFS, quantum financial system type of uh, assets, you know, quantum financial system, very vague phrase. I just kind of put that out there. People resonate with it. Um, and I think it does kind of accurately describe the energy of what's going on here. But um, the QFS and, and uh, this flip switch is going to, if, if we don't get it for a while, Flare is going to allow us to essentially have passive income and and collect more coins while we wait for that event to happen. So we don't have to wait for the market cycle or the utility market cycle to come in to say make uh, gains. We can now, when this network goes live, for instance, even if you don't have the Spark token, one thing you can do is you can take your XRP or your XLM or your Doge or your Litecoin, mint it into the F asset version, which is their trustless uh, DeFi version of those assets. And then just by holding that F asset, you get a series of uh, rewards. There's there's uh, a few different ways that you can go about um, using utilizing these different tokens on the Flare network to make passive income. And just by holding those F assets is one of the ways. So there's one example of how we're going to be able to make passive income while we wait for this. And there's kind of a flip side to it too in, in the sense of um, the potential risk factor, which I'm still personally feeling out the, you know, the risk and the safety of the potential of, you know, say the Flare Network launches and then we get XRP mooning a little bit later and maybe we don't know when it's going to moon, but there are some questions to be asked around the, the risk uh, the trustless and the risk factor of of uh, minting those F assets and then redeeming them. So the only kind of risk that I see at the moment is it basically comes down to if your personal agent for minting your F assets, because the way this works is that there's an agent on the other side that provides the spark as collateral, which could be you if you own spark or flare upon network launch those agents provide that collateral. And if they default on their side of the contract um, because XRP moons and they want to take off with the XRP, they're going to be hev heavily penalized for that. So they're not going to have the incentive to, but they can, right? It, the network allows them to. And in that case, you'll be reimbursed with, right now they have it coded in as two and a half times the amount of XRP, but in Spark that they will reimburse you with if your if your, uh, agent defaults. So that's the kind of only risk there. Um, I'm still kind of assessing personally how much risk that actually is and if that's likely and how, for instance, how much of my XRP percentage-wise I'm going to mint into FXRP. So that's a that's an interesting discussion that I would like to have maybe with some other people in the space like uh, Zen and uh, maybe some some other people from the roundtable to kind of talk about this because I think that's, an, that's a question maybe you guys have too regarding flare and these minting of the f assets like the risks and um, if you go watch mickey b fresh youtube channel the DeFi standard they have videos that break this down on a more technical stance and um you know we won't we won't really know until the network launches how it feels how well it operates but i have a feeling that it's going to be 
pretty dang smooth and that you know there's a reason that this has been put off for so long as far as the launch so and then of course we have flare finance which is a separate group it is built by anons literally the team the developers whoever financed it as well it's all anonymous no one knows who's behind it they have all the samurai um symbolism which is connected to uh mr t and a lot of there's 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 a ton of samurai symbolism around the the positive light groups right now and it's almost like this um kind of secret society kind of uh, symbolism message for the light working groups in these areas that's what i've noticed at least um you know we've we've connected how like with mr t uh, at the i think it was the it was cpac or another conference like that how there was a japanese guy there who called trump a samurai and uh, all this other samurai symbolism related to kind of this uprising of this shift and then on the more technical side, Flare Finance is, of course, going to be uh, providing a ton of other opportunities for passive income and all sorts of other stuff on the Flare network, um, including liquidity pool mining, yield mining, same thing, which is basically the ability to stake your assets in a, in a pool and get rewards for them. So between Flare Networks and Flare Finance, there's going to be so many ways to make passive income and create these larger um, boosts in technological, economic, social governance development, because this is going to go beyond finances. This is going into the like social governance realm. And um, you know, going back to that Flare Finance trailer that I have a, a video of on my channel, you can go back and check Flare Finance trailer analysis with the big old 17th letter of the alphabet in the thumbnail. Um, they they depict us, you know basically going with advanced space travel secret space program type of technology uh wormhole travel going to other planets um creating these networks throughout the planetary systems they depict all that and it's all running on flare flare networks flare finance and xrp in that trailer so really fascinating stuff and gets me really stoked for what's to come in terms of the the QFS and Space Force and uh, SpaceX and Starlink and all this connected stuff, it's um, I get a really good vibe about it, and I think it's gonna blow our minds with the 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 shifts that are to come on this side of things. Because of course we have the energetic shifts that are coming, but there's gonna be these tangible kind of more 3D shifts too that are really gonna, you know, they call it the Great Reset for a reason and. You know, if, if you're wondering why I'm talking about the Great Reset, because you're like, oh, the Great Reset, isn't that the NWO kind of timeline? Aren't we looking for the Great Awakening? Well, I, I believe that they are one and the same. I believe that the the positive groups, the WH, I don't want to say with the full term because I feel like that's a trigger word now, but these groups, I feel like, have co-opted this timeline. They co-opted the, the pandemic timeline. They co-opted the likely the, uh, the jab timeline. And I think that they co-opted this Great Reset timeline in the terms of what it was supposed to be on the dark side of things. And I think that they're running with the same terms, the same lingo, calling it the Great Reset. But it's actually going to be a Great Reset for the people now. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect the way that we uh, interact with um, value and money and liquidity and flow of all that stuff. And our sovereignty when it comes to finances and not being dependent on these groups and kind of goes back to these ideas behind like the Venus project of um, going to this kind of society where we have, you know, automation of a lot of these jobs that people don't want, these crappy jobs, these slave jobs, whether it's, you know, warehouse workers or, you know, garbage truck cleaners or s people cleaning the sewers or, um, you know, anything that can be automated that doesn't require human based intellect and intelligence and artistic expression right the jobs that nobody wants these are the jobs we're going to automate with basic forms of ai not ai not what peter Thiel would call agi i believe he calls it which is a more advanced type of artificial intelligence because ai is a very broad term right like there's a lot of different things that could be called ai and on the simple side of things um on these simple AIs that can automate things, but they don't necessarily have the ability to think for themselves. That's what was kind of presented in the Venus Project, if you guys are familiar with that uh, project, 
documentary series from a while back. And uh, I believe that it's all tied in with what we're seeing here. And, and these kind of programs and networks are going to give people who say, you know, are going to need to find new sources of income. It's going to allow them to actually monetize what they love. And it's going to be through networks like Flare and similar blockchain networks that we're able to monetize every aspect of our lives from, you know, this is what I picture from from going on runs and being able to get paid just for every step you take on a run to, you know, being paid to play video games. If that's your thing and you play video games all day, you're a streamer or whatever, or if you're, you know, a developer for advanced technologies, um, you know, those things are more traditional you're going to make money from. But there's going to be ways to make money from the most basic aspects of life as just a natural uh, exchange of energy from the universe, but brought into more of the tangible 3D sense of, um, you know, we, we as humans on Earth, we deserve to be taken care of, not by a government that decides how it works, but by a decentralized system run by the people for the people governed by the people, which is what, you know, they always taught us it was supposed to be, especially here in the United States, but of course, it never actually worked that way. And so now we're moving to a system that is actually going to enable this and empower people on the individual level to accomplish their dreams and really express their creative and intellectual skills and talents with the world. So super excited for that. And then the next big thing I want to get into is this cyber attack drill that we had going on yesterday, which was July 9th, Friday. So this is called Cyber Polygon. This is a World Economic Forum essentially cybersecurity event. So remember how remember how event remember how this uh I don't know if I should even say it, but <laughs> I'll put the numbers on the screen. Event that, right? I feel like that's a major trigger word. If you look up event, this number, this number, this number. That was an event that preceded this whole crazy 2020 year that basically was a trial run for this. And so this is kind of a similar thing for the, um, uh, this is a similar thing for the, the cybersecurity side of things. And you guys give me one moment, I gotta fix my light real quick. There we go. Okay, so this is kind of a, um, a trial run for the same kind of thing and they are warning us in a more direct way and I believe that this is the positive groups now that are warning us of this I don't think that these groups were originally positive but I think that they've been co-opted and I think that a lot since so many people know about this event uh, that preceded 2020 and 2019 I think that uh, it's almost like giving people the next step of the breadcrumbs and they're like okay so this preceded this now we're telling you guys that this is going to happen and you know they're warning us about it and so i'm just going to read you a quick summary of this and then i want to show you a video from uh talking about this event from people at the world economic forum including klaus schwab so cyber polygon is a unique cybersecurity event that combines the world's largest technical training exercise for corporate teams and an online conference featuring senior officials from international organizations and leading corporations the 2021 conference discusses the key risks of digitalization and best practice for the secure development of digital ecosystems. The 2021 technical exercise builds and tests the skills needed to protect our industries, centering on target, targeted supply chain attack. Every year, the training brings together global businesses and government agencies to collaborate on technical exercises. The live stream draws in millions of speculators from around the world. That's interesting. I didn't even know there was a live stream. That's the first time I've read that. Um, they have the results about 2020, reached 5 million people from 57 nations. They have a comprehensive report from 2020 you can go read. And it says, this year discussions during the live stream conference will center on secure development of ecosystems with global digitalization further accelerating and people, companies, and countries becoming more interconnected. Security of every single element of a supply chain is key to ensuring the sustainability of the whole system. During the technical exercise, participants will hone their practical skills in mitigating a targeted supply chain attack on corporate ecosystem in real time. Very interesting how time is on its own line. I don't know if that's just the way my... Looks like everything else is formatted normal, but they put time in its own line. That's, that's interesting. 
The event will be held on July 9th, which again was yesterday. And of course, we didn't hear about any crazy things going down. Um, I was going to jump to this a little later, but there was a couple of things, including... It, hackers disrupt Iran's rail service with fake delay messages. So rail services all over the country were disrupted. Uh, trains across Iran had lost their electronic tracking system. It wasn't immediately clear if that was also part of the cyber attack. And then in Germany, District Council declares Germany's first ever cyber catastrophe. And this was this was written today, but again, right after that trial. So... A lot of these, you know, just like with the 911 event, there were trainings going on for these events right before they happened. So it's likely that, you know, this is intertwined in some way or that, you know, some maybe some of these events were actually part of the the you know, simulation. We don't really know. But it's nice that we woke up today and, you know, there wasn't some kind of crazy cyber attack event because I know a lot of people were in one form or another, or another sort of expecting that. And um, I'm glad that everything is fine today. And I think that's a good sign. So I want to play you this real quick, just um, like a minute or two. The crisis, uh, it will be more significant. And, you know, we need to actually start preparing for that now when we do see this next crisis it will be faster than what we've seen with covid uh, the exponential growth rate will climb uh, be much steeper uh, the impact will be greater and as a result the economic and social uh, implications will be even more significant even more significant. What is this next crisis that we just heard Jeremy Jurgens, Harvard educated managing director of the World Economic Forum, describing? Well, now let's hear from Klaus Schwab himself. We all know, but still. So, this is the guy that cr created the World Economic Forum. To the frightening scenario of a comprehensive cyber attack. Doesn't, doesn't he just come off as like a stereotypical Bond villain? Incomprehensible cyber attack. <laughs> the frightening scenario. The frightening scenario. Of a comprehensive cyber attack, which would bring to a complete halt to the power supply, transportation, hospital services, our society as a whole. The COVID-19. He, he sounds too excited about this. He's like he's gonna jizz his pants about this idea. Isis would be seen in this respect, as a small disturbance in comparison to a major cyber attack. A major cyber attack. It's just like stereotypical Bond villain, textbook. To use the COVID-19 crisis as a timely opportunity to reflect on the lessons the cybersecurity community can draw and improve our in preparedness for a potential cyber pandemic. Yes, a cyber pandemic. And before we even talk about what that is, I just want to again appreciate that we just heard two leaders of the World Economic Forum promise that we are going to have a new crisis soon that dwarfs COVID, which has already spelled the end of the world as we know it. All right, so this was uh, taken from Bearable Bull's YouTube channel. That guy isn't the Bearable Bull, but he put this clip in the beginning and wanted to share it because I thought it was a good clip. Um, but yes, they're telling us what's going to happen, right? They're, like I said, they've done these kind of simulations, exercises, trials repeatedly before these kind of events. And once again, we have two prominent people in the World Economic Forum saying this is going to happen. And we don't know. Again, like the true nature behind this, if this is, you know, for lack of better words, an evil plan, or if this is, if they're, these guys are basically just puppets now for the greater golden kind of timeline. And I don't know, I'm not like decided either way. I kind of just view all of this as parts in the movie and these people are all actors in the movie. And this is just everything is contributing toward the greater end result of 
the mass awakening and the liberation of the planet. Even the stuff that comes across as being nefarious and evil, I think, is inadvertently doing that. And um, yeah, it's really interesting stuff. So I know some people, when I shared this in the Telegram group, which, by the way, if you're not in the Telegram group, go join the Telegram group, Cosmic Origins Channel. I believe it's t.me slash Cosmic Origins Channel. And then there's also the Cosmic Origins Chat group. And uh, I'll try to put those down in the description below. And in my Telegram group, I was dis- uh, we were discussing this and some people were bringing up like, what should we do basically? Like, is this something we should worry about? What can we do to prepare? And I would say the biggest thing you can do to prepare is honestly own crypto assets, not any crypto assets, right? Not Bitcoin or Ethereum, but these coins that we're talking about, XRP, XLM, XDC, Quant, um, SHX Stronghold is one I recently just got. These coins that are involved in the financial institution side of things, these coins that are going to be the plumbing of what we're calling the quantum financial system, these are the coins that it will benefit to invest in if there is some kind of cyber attack on the financial, banking, economic system. And this is something Mr. Poole warned us about. This is something that Poole had said uh, money is not safe in the banks, the banks are not safe that uh, there will be an opportunity for the masses to reinvest was a prominent thing that Mr. Poole said, which basically insinuates that there will, there will I'm thinking there will likely be some kind of crash of the market, whether it's Bitcoin or the, the, the main stock market and the other markets, or there's going to be some kind of um, obvious event that I think will give people the option to reinvest in crypto, in particular cryptocurrencies. And it'll be, you know, it'll be up to people's free will. Some people will be too scared to do that and they'll stick with their fiat and hopefully it works out for them. But um, and I, I'm not insinuating you should sell or you should you should purchase, you know, spend all of your fiat on um, crypto. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm not saying you should do anything because I don't give financial advice. Right. This is not financial advice at all. This is just entertainment talking about um, these concepts and sharing ideas and concepts that we are passionate about. But uh, according to Mr. Poole, it seems like that by holding these assets that are going to be used in the new system moving forward, that can be a way to kind of protect yourself against these kind of cyber attacks that could be incoming. So, you know, to kind of bring that to a very simple example, say that large banks are cyber attacked, right? Right now we're living in a digital system that really is not backed by anything and means nothing, which means that your money in your bank is pretty much worth nothing. Like it's it's ones and zeros in a computer system, right? So if someone hacks into that computer system, they change a few lines of code and all of a sudden, you know, you don't have any more money in your bank or on the flip side, you're a millionaire, right? And it's just it's just a few lines of code that you can change. And that's the problem with our current corrupt digital system is that the majority of money is digital. That's the majority of where value is held right now. Most people don't have cash reserves or um, gold or silver as their primarily primary store of value. They have it in the bank. And so to go from that to a secure digital system, um, run off the blockchain and cryptocurrencies you're you're going from a fake fraudulent digital system which is what we're on with the traditional banking system to a system that is actually secured and backed by technology and utility and value right so this is the difference too between just going to a digital system that's cashless which is you know the kind of timeline people are afraid of one coin to rule them all kind of thing it's not what we want we want an ecosystem of currencies that have utility that different currencies within this ecosystem have different utilities and serve different purposes within the ecosystem where they complement each other. They're not competing. And so that's where, you know, we've talked about how like XRP, XTC, XLM, Algorand, IOTA, Quant, all these coins on the ISO 22 uh, interledger protocol and also the overledger protocol, um, they're not competing. It's not like XTC is competing with XRP. It's really not the case even though maybe it seems like that on the surface. These coins serve different utilities on a basic level, and they're going to be used for their maximum utility use case. And so that's where, you know, right now the dollar doesn't have a utility because until this point, currencies have not had utility other than store value. But now we're moving into a place where currencies have actual utility. 
And an example of that utility would say be instant liquidity with XRP settlement token, the ability to settle any transaction from a dollar to tens of millions of dollars in two to four seconds um, to billions of dollars. Uh, why cap it at tens of millions, right? Any amount of value you want to move two to four seconds, you got to move there. Um, and you have other coins like XDC, which are more smart contract based. And even though they are also settlement tokens, they have other use cases um, that are slightly different in the particular niche. And so, you know, this is a new concept for currency to have utilities where the currencies themselves have a utility beyond the storage of value. And that might still be kind of a mind trip for some people to kind of understand. But I think as we move further into this new era of sovereign um, value flow and sovereign finances and economics, people are going to understand more how the utility of these blockchain tokens work and how that will affect our systems moving forward. And it kind of goes back to this concept of um, with, you know, gold, too, that. You know, a lot of us know that there are replicator technologies in a lot of these black budget programs. And by replicator technology, it's basically fancy, fancy 3D printers that are able to replicate anything from technology to food in, you know, a very short amount of time. And it basically makes resource scarcity non-existent. So that means that you could hypothetically print as many bars of gold as you want. And this is something that kind of the Nazis had figured out during World War II when they were building their Deglocken craft. And if you're familiar with the concept of these craft, they would take liquid mercury, which was known to the ancients as the, the, uh, the basically the king of alchemy when it came to these metals. Um, mercury was the, uh, uh, the base metal that was used in alchemy because it could, it could be transformed into many other kinds of metals and minerals and so what the nazis were doing is they were taking the mercury spinning it really fast and supercharging it with tons of electricity and um, if done right with the right frequencies it would create an anti-gravity effect but they were messed there's lots of reports of this they were messing up when they were experimenting on this and the mercury was often turning to solid gold and so this is kind of where in more modern times, this concept has resurfaced of being able to create things like gold and these other, min other minerals. So if you're at a place as a civilization where you have gold that can be printed on demand and, you know, gold is typically the thing that is the most um, physical representation of value in our current system. But all of a sudden, you know, Joe Schmo can print as many bars of gold as he wants in his basement. This is, you know. This is, we're going to get to this point eventually. This is an, an inevitability in my mind. And uh, so what, what creates value at that point, right? It's going to be the value of one, art, and two, utility. So on one end, it's going to be the creative value of the artistic expression of a sovereign mind, right? Because that'll now be the new... Uh, scarcity in a way, the new valuable thing from an economic kind of market standpoint. Um, from a more spiritual standpoint, it's going to, it's going to, you know, going back to this Venus Project autom automation idea, it's going to get rid of all the things that have been distracting us from uh, fulfilling our true potentials as creator beings. And we're going to be able to go to the state of being able to go back to creator beings because we don't need to slave ourselves away to survive. We don't need to do all this stuff we don't like. We don't need to, you know, we're going to go to the state of being able to create pretty fast from what our intentions are, both technologically and metaphysically. And so this is where I see um, currencies like cryptocurrencies, blockchain currencies, and technologies um, are going to start to become, I think, more valuable when we do get these technologies coming forward where, say, you can print gold really fast because now you need perhaps a currency or an exchange of value that is not based on that physical material that you could print an infinite supply of. But with coins and with utility and, you know, with, with these cryptocurrencies, you have a certain set amount of coins typically, um, unless you're Bitcoin, <laughs> Um, but you typically have a, a, a cap of the amount of coins in circulation, and so it can never be inflationary. And then you have the utility on top of that. So now the value for these currencies becomes in the utility behind them, and that's what drives the value of the system. So 
whew, it's going to be exciting times moving forward. There's a lot to look forward to. And, you know, I just kind of want to reassure people who are still nervous about moving towards what they see as a digital system um, away from what, you know, we've had as maybe a cash system, but really uh, securing the fact that we are we're already in a digital system that's fraudulent. We need to move to one that's actually backed by value, backed by utility, backed by perhaps gold, you know, until we get to the scenario that we just talked about. So, yes, let's jump back over here. And we talked about the hacker disruption in Iran and Germany. And I wanted to touch on the G20. So G20 sounds like it's going on right now, and it says they are endorsing historic global tax reform. Uh, G20 finance ministers on Saturday gave their backing to a historic deal to overhaul the way multinational companies are taxed and urged holdout countries to get on board. Some 132 countries have already signed up to a framework for international tax reform, including a minimum corporate rate of 15% struck earlier this month. So... Interesting. They said, quote, we have achieved a historic agreement on more stable and fair international tax architecture. The minister said in a final statement following two days of talks in Venice hosted by G20 president in Italy. And then from uh, Insider, they say G20 finance chiefs will have have endorsed a crackdown on tax havens that will hit Amazon, Google and other multinationals. So. You know, historically, the things coming out of these big conventions and conferences, the, the G7, G20, you know, all that stuff, typically have not been good. But I get the feeling, again, that there has been shifts in what is going on and that this is uh, probably a part of the larger financial restructuring with the Great Reset that is going on. And we'll have to wait and see. We will see what happens. Uh, another story I wanted to throw in here was about this uh, the death of the, the Haitian prime minister, I think, the prime minister or president, who was assassinated. And they put this number in here, right? So anytime I see stories like this with this number, it's, you know, you got to look at it. Haitian police detained 17 suspects after the assassination of President Jovenel Moise. I apologize. I know I'm <laughs> saying his name wrong, likely. And so, yeah, interesting stuff. And there's a lot developing with with this whole Haiti story. And, you know, perhaps this will inevitably lead to the exposure of all the crimes that have occurred in Haiti, particularly with HRC and all that stuff that most of us are pretty familiar with. So, um, yeah, during wrapping up here. I want to let you guys know that tonight we are going to be going live on a roundtable at 5 p.m. PST. We're just about a little a little less than six hours away or when this airs will be about five hours away and it's going to be journey to truth hosting it tyler and aaron and we're going to have kate awakening a of Sirius, and then me and alexis and we're just gonna talk about whatever amazing topics come up it's always great to have a roundtable with these folks they're some of our closest friends and um just great great people and we're all going to be at family of light together in sedona arizona in just two weeks here so again, check out the Great Family of Light Gathering website, familyoflight.info, description down below, all these amazing speakers. It's all centered around the cultivation and activation of our mind, body, and spirit. So each day is focused on either mind, body, or spirit with the topics. Uh, it's all in the beautiful red rock vortices of Sedona, Arizona, which you can see pictured here. I took this myself on my drone. I love this photo. It's so beautiful. And from the venue, it's going to be indoor venue, air-conditioned, um, amazing views of the Red Rocks, as you can see here from the courtyard. You can see the Red Rocks. Uh, it's a, it's such a great spot, such good vibes. This is the indoor part of the venue. Um, and then, yeah, there's the courtyard, and there's another room where we'll have with vendors, and uh, we'll have food, and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be so dope. Uh, my friend Mario, who has a company called Starseed Salsa, makes amazing superfood salsa. He's going to be making food for the event. And he's going to be bringing his salsa, which is he puts like all sorts of different um, like mushrooms, healing mushrooms in there. Like uh, I'm pretty sure like lion's mane and turkey tail. And then he has like ashwagandha. And it's it's honestly the best salsa I've ever had. So 
we'll have that at the events. <laughs> you got to have make sure that the, you know, the food thing is covered on the on the grounded side of things so that we can ground in all this awesome cosmic energy we're going to be channeling in for this event. So if you have any questions about that, reach out to me. Um, you can check out the schedule here. And then, of course, we also have the live stream passes. If you uh, can't make it out to the event in physical, really great price. It's only 70 bucks if you pay with XRP. And it's going to really be worth it. There's going to be so many great speakers, and we're just so stoked. It's such a great group of people with a diverse group of expertise and experiences and topics to cover that are all based in consciousness and awakening and activation. So I'm so excited for this, and I really hope to see you guys there. So without further ado, thank you for tuning in. This has been The Cosmic Download with Jace, and I will see you guys next week. Much love and peace out, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen across planet Earth, what's up? And welcome to Morning Coffee. What's up, guys? <laughs> I am Kate Buckley. Some of you may know me as uh, from my Twitter or my YouTube channel, The Kate Awakening. Thanks, Mom. Where's everybody at? Where are you at, family? It, yeah. it, was, it, it was at that point I knew, like, I was like, this feels good. I know we're like doing yeah, something right same. here. Yeah. Good day. I greet you in the love and the light of the infinite creator. This is Baseline. I'm your host, Xavier Hawk. It was pumping. I knew when the masses woke up, they were going to want to ride that wave and there's going to be a big push. Before that, though, I'm just going to burn a little bit of Palo Santo. Just get everybody settled in. Hey, what's up guys? I'm Jonathan White. I'm here to help you master your sexual energy so you can manifest your ideal life. See, you can't be afraid of anything in life, you guys. You gotta just get over your fear, especially if you're afraid of doing something. That's all the more reason why you should hit it and go for it. Pedal to the metal, because fear is just a frequency you don't want to live in. You wear your blues like a new pair of shoes and keep the secret to your heart locked up in a tomb. I got the tool to make your mind, body, and spirit move, but I pursued all I can and now the rest is up to you. Beep, bubble, beep. Hello, hello. I see you all here. This would be considered in a way a blackout if the hours did roll by and there was no data all of a sudden, but it was just all black. That's what we call a blackout. Hey, hey, happy Saturday, everybody. Welcome to The Cosmic Download. My name is Jace. Getting the gang back together. The tribe is gathering.